Britain, a country with a deep and rich political history of having a monarch, and then a prime minister and a monarch, and then a prime minister and... Wait, we still have a monarch. Britain is also a country famous for its alcoholism. Uh, be it beer, wine, or whatever the hell WKD is, we Brits do indeed love a good drink. But can alcohol help us understand Britain's complex political history? Well, maybe it can. Today, I will be providing an alcoholic history of every prime minister, all 55 of them to be specific. To do this, I have created an objective map to plot all the prime ministers onto so that we can truly understand where they sit in political history. So here we have the chart. The y-axis here is the percentage of alcohol from high to low. This representing how powerful said prime minister was in their time, i.e. how strong of a drink they are. Huh? Get it? A high percentage would be a prime minister who had a lot of power in their time and got a lot done, whereas a low percentage would be someone who was fairly weak or didn't really do that much. And the x-axis, as you can see, is the price of said drink. And this is going to be representing how interesting they are, uh, be it politically or personally. I like to think of this as if you walked into your history class and you were told you would be studying this individual, how bored do you think you would be? It's also important to recognize that this axis here doesn't mean good or bad, it just means interesting. You know, one can be interesting because they do good, and one can be interesting because they do a lot of bad. Right then, let's jump straight in here with the top right quadrant. These prime ministers, be it good or bad, were undeniably very strong in their time, as well as having interesting stories. Consider this quadrant to be like a classic whiskey, expensive and rather strong. However, a lot of what makes these individuals interesting might mean that they're best consumed in small quantities. This quadrant is best defined by our first name here, Winston Churchill. Undeniably very powerful in his time, leading Britain through World War II, and with a very complex history alongside it. So we're just gonna put him very expensive because he's interesting, very high percentage because he was very powerful. Margaret Thatcher, the first ever female prime minister, shattering glass ceilings, breaking into the boys club, or just to crush unions and begin the neoliberal hellscape that we currently live in. But she also quite liked whiskey. So Robert Peel started off pretty boring, uh, but then in his second term, he was involved in economic reform, uh, industrial reform, the corn laws, uh, but what really solidifies Peel as someone who it would be interesting to learn about is that in 1843, Someone tried to assassinate him, and that's pretty exciting. And before we jump in just very quickly here, as you can see on the screen right there, very few of you are actually subscribed, so to celebrate this prime ministerial party, why don't you give a sub to the channel? Next up, every centrist Labour member and Andrew Adonis' wet dream, Tony Blair. Blair was very powerful in his time, with extremely popular mandates, and hey, what's more interesting than invading a foreign country based off of false information, blindly following some dumbass random guy from the White House and for it all go to shit. Current Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, currently has a strong mandate uh, with a not very prominent or vocal opposition in the form of Keir Starmer and uh, as seen by the six seasons and immense popularity of the show Love Island, nothing's more exciting than a scandalous love life. David Cameron started weak in coalition, became powerful with a majority, then ended weak when he was cucked by Nigel Farage. And whilst the majority of his person isn't particularly interesting, being the standard Eton to Oxbridge pipeline, his escapades with pigs is definitely pretty exciting. Harold Wilson partially decriminalized male homosexuality and abortion, he reformed divorce and abolished censorship of theater. Overall, just pretty cool. Clement Attlee, founder of the NHS, big on power, bigger on personality. Truly one of, if not the biggest and most notable name in Labour's history. There you go. Disraeli here, famous for his One Nation conservatism, ended public executions, did much to end electoral bribery, and even used an early version of nationalization with the post office and telegraphs. An actually pretty interesting case of a seemingly progressive conservative, at least for the time. William Ewart Gladstone had four premiership, was big on reducing government involvement in people's lives, apparently his popularity amongst the working class earned him the nickname The People's William, which, I don't know, sounds a bit like to me when you go into school and you say, hey everyone, can you call me Big Smiley? And everyone says, no Hugh, you don't have the body for that, shut up. But yeah, kind of like an early British libertarian, I guess. Henry Pelham, one of the first prime ministers, is the story of someone in a position of restricted power by the monarchy. He actually managed to do a decent amount of stuff, uh, considering that at this point the monarchy was still pretty much entirely in charge, especially in comparison to others in the 1700s. So definitely an interesting case of PM starting to wrestle some control away from the crown. Walpole, the first ever British prime minister, political power made the Whigs the dominant name in British politics not seeing an opposition victory until 1762. Being the first ever prime minister is undeniably interesting. You know, like the first time you try a beer, whilst nothing really exciting happened, 
it's still pretty cool that it happened for the first time. And finally, we have David Lloyd George. Uh, Lloyd George started out as a World War I Prime Minister, so not actually that much gets done during these periods. Generally, it's more about unity. But after this, he actually did quite a lot of stuff, including uh, education reform, housing, uh, workers' rights reform, expanding suffrage. Uh, also, I don't know if you can see it here, but amazing mustache, and that deserves some commendation. Wish I could grow a mustache like that. You should see my Movember attempt, Movember attempt on screen wasn't very good. So these are our powerful and interesting prime ministers. Moving on now to the bottom right quadrant, to those who, despite being fairly weak, are actually very interesting and exciting. Uh, consider this quadrant here to be kind of like a fine wine, uh, which despite its relative weakness in terms of alcohol content and in terms of power, uh, still has a complex and fascinating story to go with it. This quadrant is perfectly exemplified by George Canning, who, after a long and distinguished career across positions in the cabinet and around British politics, was prime minister for less than a year before having to stand down due to extreme illness. But in 1809, he was in a fucking duel with a fellow cabinet minister, right? He was, he's amazing, right? His story is incredible. The man had never picked up a gun before, right? Yeah, never picked up a gun. He rocks up, pistols drawn, ready to go. Okay, and then, and then he missed his shot. And then he got shot in the leg. It caused a massive scandal. But I mean, come on, how much more interesting would politics be if we brought back the mother flipping jewel? Am I right, guys? Right down there. Moving on now to Viscount Melbourne, who despite doing very little as prime minister, had quite a colorful personal life to say the least. Quite a famous story was that he was subject to a blackmailing scandal, um, which is, you know, pretty exciting. Basically, some guy accused Melbourne of sleeping with his wife and demanded £1,400. When Melbourne refused, it was taken public. Whilst this would normally destroy the career of a politician in the 1830s, uh, Melbourne, being well-liked, actually survived this scandal, serving two premierships in total, which is pretty impressive. However, it's important to recognise that, according to historian Boyd Hilton, there's evidence to suggest some... Epstein-style dodginess involving whips and other stuff. Uh, so yeah, pretty awful. In fact, not just pretty, really, really awful, but undeniably interesting. His Wikipedia page is definitely a roller coaster of emotion. Neville Chamberlain, kind of on the border between interesting and boring, whilst he himself was dull as fuck, uh, with an interest in botany, birds, and fishing. His story uh, in the build-up to World War II and his attempts to appease Hitler is undeniably fascinating. Lord North. Following the Boston Tea Party in 1773, Lord North passed a bunch of bills to punish the Bostonians for their heinous crime of wasting crate to crate of good tea. This, however, further inflamed Massachusetts and other colonies, eventually resulting in open war during the Boston Campaign of 1775 and 1776. Basically, Lord North played a big role in the UK losing America, which I'll be honest, it's probably for the best. I mean, can you imagine a world without America? Oh. Ramsay MacDonald, the most interesting about his premiership was when he basically backstabbed the Labour Party by breaking from the party, setting up a national government with the Tories, and I believe with the Liberals and or the Whigs, I don't remember. He didn't actually do much with this national government, but it's still an interesting political story of one of, if probably not the largest backstabbing in British political history. The Marquess of Salisbury here didn't accomplish much due to his lack of parliamentary majority, but he did get called out by the Queen for racism. I don't know how racist you have to be to be in the late 1800s and for the monarchy to call you out, but hey, he managed to do it, so I guess that's something. Onto the Earl of Wilmington. He didn't do that much, but he worked so hard that he died. After a long career across political roles, Andrew Bonner Law here became Prime Minister for a year, got throat cancer, couldn't speak in Parliament, so had to resign. But I guess his name is Boner, so I guess that's kind of funny. Is that insensitive? I mean, this was a long time ago, but is it too soon? We're getting it too soon. Shout out too soon in comments if it's too soon. There we go. Spencer Percival, uh, described as small, slight, and very pale. Oh, and uh, usually dressed in black. Lord Eldon uh, used to call him Little P. Basically, the closest that Britain's ever gotten to a white SoundCloud rapper as Prime Minister. Now, I know what you're thinking. What's he done that's so interesting? Why isn't he just boring? Well, he was actually assassinated. Not just like that earlier guy where he was attempted to be assassinated. He was assassinated. 
pretty exciting stuff. If I'm learning about British political history, I want to learn about the murders, not about foreign policy. Eden resigned after the Suez Crisis, which is quite an interesting story actually. He also fought in the war. I don't know, it was a fan of Call of Duty World War II. That's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, Duke of Wellington. As for power, he was largely focused on Catholic emancipation, granting almost full civil rights to Catholics. But where the real interest lies is in his duel. That's right, we got another duelist, baby. The Earl of Winchester insulted him, and Wellington immediately challenged him to a duel. Neither of them died. Is it even a duel? Is it a duel if you both walk away? Or is it just like a friendly shooting bout? That's my question. There we go. Asquith, he reformed the Lords and brought the UK into World War I, which is kind of exciting, I guess. Lord John Russell. Definition of a car crash that is so horrible you just can't look away. And why can't you look away? Because it's really interesting. Russell's government led the response to the Irish famine, which they handled so terribly that it is estimated around 1 million people died. Yeah. Last one in this category, we have the Earl of Bute, uh, the first Scottish Prime Minister and the first Conservative Prime Minister. Uh, he was notable for negotiating the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Seven Year War. Uh, and he actually resigned shortly after a journalist called John Wilkes published a scathing satirization of him in the North Britain. If that doesn't scream weak, I don't know what does. But hey, it's interesting because it's the first example of the press bullying a politician out of office. Pretty exciting, you know, there's a lot of that to come. The next quadrant we are going to be moving to are those with high alcohol content, but a low price. These are the leaders who, despite their enormous power, manage to do pretty much nothing exciting with it. Think of this group as a can of special brew, lots of bang for your buck, but nothing is actually very interesting in and of themselves, or at least limited amounts. This quadrant is best defined by Edward Heath, who took the UK into the European economic community, undeniably a big deal, but not a very sexy one. Plus, we're not in it anymore, so who cares? Everyone knows that history truly began on 23rd of July, 2016, when we finally decided to get our glorious sovereignty back, God save the Queen, rule Britannia, all of that stuff. You see this? You see this? This? This is a Union Jack pillow. The, the woke left, you can get, they'll arrest you for this nowadays, right? Yeah? God save the Queen. There we go. Harold Macmillan had a big focus on foreign policy and was big on expanding the UK's nuclear capabilities. But in terms of interest, I'm here for jewels, drugs, sex scandals, not foreign policy. Boring. Much more interesting, however, is Earl Grey, probably the most British name ever. Despite his relatively boring personal life and general political life, it, he had one thing which was his saving grace, which was that in 1833, he abolished slavery across the British Empire. Undeniably a fascinating and important point in Britain's murky history. Arthur Balfour, whilst involving himself in several major areas, including education, Irish land purchasing, the military, Anglo-French relations, um, Look, okay, I'll level with you. I don't have a punchline for this one. He just did those things. That is it. There's nothing else. Earl of Derby. He was the head of two minority governments, which means twice the amount of boring nothingness. Uh, however, his 22-year uh, tenure as conservative leader sort of stands as the longest ever. So he must have had some decent power. Also, amazing beard. Once again, I don't know if you can see this, but there you go. Truly the art of facial hair is lost in the modern day. Correction, Earl Grey's meant to be up here. I got him confused with the Earl of Derby. The Earl of Derby is meant to be kind of down, down there. The Earl of Liverpool was the first prime minister to regularly wear long trousers instead of knee breeches. That's about it. But I mean, hey, he was a trendsetter. William Pitt the Elder dominated British politics in the middle 18th century. But as Prime Minister for only two years, he didn't actually do that much. Uh, the most interesting he did was create a slightly more exciting son. William Pitt the Younger now uh, was involved largely in foreign policy, be it France, Haiti, Ireland and more. Uh, he actually did quite a lot to define the role of Prime Minister as the supervisor and co-coordinator of the various governmental departments. So whilst increasing its power quite a lot and sort of defining the role, nothing that spicy really came from him directly. It's more about what he sort of set up for later down the road. A common string in the mid 1800s uh, was coalition governments. So due to the large division at the time, this often led to just boring centrism. This can be seen very well with the Earl of Aberdeen, who whilst doing some foreign policy stuff, wasn't actually that fun. Viscount Palmerston. Not much really going on here. 
but he was the oldest prime minister appointed in history uh, at the age of 70. He fought against the first ever filibuster in parliament uh, to allow courts to divorce people. But in his second premiership, he very much allied himself closely to the American Confederacy. And look, we all know how that went. Uh, not the least interesting, but not the most powerful, basically. The Marquess of Rockingham was actually quite busy as Prime Minister. He repealed the Stamp Act, tried to assert UK power over US colonies, but then later came in and argued to acknowledge them as independent, passed the Relief for the Poor Act. However, his second term was short-lived due to influenza. Not the most exciting way to go out. Rockingham's there kind of nearly in the middle between the two. Finally, in this category, we have Stanley Baldwin. Baldwin had three terms, which is pretty impressive. However, a lot of the time this was due to others falling ill or resigning, leaving him in power. Uh, he did abdicate King Henry VIII. That's pretty baller. I think he is actually okay. On to the bottom of the barrel now. Truly the worst thing a prime minister can be. Weak and boring. These drinks are both low on alcohol content and low on price. Basically like a WKD or a Smirnoff Ice. They're pretty weak and they're pretty, they're, you know, they're not very exciting. This category I think is best defined by the Earl of Rosebery, who was only chosen because he was the liberal who Queen Victoria disliked the least. Uh, and he then proceeded to do virtually nothing in his one year in charge. There you go, buddy. Right down there. My pint finished. I will be back in one second. Devonshire. Boring, like Dart, lasted one year. Theresa May, not much of a personality. Uh, however, her time as prime minister did have quite a bit of scandal. We have the Grenfell tragedy and the Windrush deportations. However, I think that too much of her premiership was dominated by Brexit, which just isn't that fun at all. I guess at least the Fields of Wheat thing was pretty funny. The Duke of Portland's time in office was damaged by his poor health. Uh, eventually he fell from the position of Prime Minister due to Canning's duel that we talked about earlier. Uh, that's right, someone else in the cabinet was in a duel. He resigned, and then later on, the guy in the duel became Prime Minister. That's pretty sad. The Duke of Newcastle sums up a lot of people in this tier. He was involved in a lot of complicated foreign policy matters, but never really did anything very flashy. Gordon Brown struggled to continue a new labor uh, after Tony Blair, and due to his rather blunt personality, there wasn't really much excitement to be found. James Callahan was quoted as an old-styled socialist and lacked any higher education, which is actually very unique for a prime minister, considering 99% of them fall into the Eton to Oxbridge pipeline. His laid-back attitude, especially to issues such as inflation, led him to not actually getting an insane amount done. You know, just sit back, man, and chill. Inflation will sort itself out. It didn't. He lost. To Thatcher. Alec Douglas Home was described by Harold Wilson as an elegant anachronism, which is basically the 60s version of the 1920s called They Want Their Prime Minister Back. Boring. Viscount Gerdrick came into power with the difficult task of balancing the interests of his cabinet and the interests of the king. He failed in this task. He did nothing. George Grenville was given the nickname Gentle Shepherd by Parliament. Does that sound interesting? No. But does it sound effective? No, that's why he's down here. He didn't do much except pass the Stamp Act, I guess. Lord Grenville, not to be confused with George over there, uh, is so uninteresting, I don't even have a joke. Yep, I'm using that one again, but it's true. You can Google him. I'm sure you'll find something interesting. I couldn't. The Duke of Grafton, get ready for this, loved horse racing. His racing colors were sky blue and a black cap. Very nice, huh? The Earl of Shelburne had some interesting deals with America. Uh, he argued with Benjamin Franklin not to secede Canadian territory to them. That's about it, really. Not much to say. Henry Addington involved himself in foreign policy. John Major, first of all, loved the glasses. Cool look. Keep it up, style king. He was very concerned with the efficiency of public services. And whilst he did certainly take efforts to improve this, there weren't any real major influencing reforms. Ha ha ha, pun, funny, moving on. There you go, right there. The second oldest person to ever come Prime Minister was Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman. Uh, and that's mostly about it. Although he did become Prime Minister at the age of 69. So, that's a bonus point. And yeah, that's it. This is our map of Prime Ministers. So we have from very interesting and very powerful to not very powerful, but very interesting. Not very interesting, but very powerful to boring and not powerful. It might be a little bit skewed because I think sometimes 
how interesting they were affected how much research I did into what they actually accomplished. Um, so if there are any major missteps that I've made, please throw them down in the comments. And yeah, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed this alcoholic history of every single British Prime Minister, uh, please like, please subscribe, maybe even throw a comment telling me how great I am. Um, or, or more specifically, tell me which of these has been your favorite, whether it's someone you've heard new, or whether it's, you know, an old classic. Uh, yeah, I'd love to hear what you think. This has certainly been interesting. And, uh, yeah, thanks for watching.